Hey guys, this is be video 11 for the how to design build a custom Sparkle Flying V using Stuart McDonald templates sometime and I actually will be doing that today. But uh, I'll just start out, I'm going to keep this video uh, as, as short as possible, but there's a possibility this is going to end up being an extremely long video. I probably will pause throughout because I'm going to show some different operations that I'm about to do. So hopefully by the time this video finishes, uh, I might actually be installing some frets, so we'll, we'll see. Let me just dive in, and uh, I've made a, a bit of a punch list over here, so I'm going to try to stick to that as much as I can. I'll start with a bit of a flyby. There's nothing really to show up here because I still have all this protected. But uh, nonetheless, uh, this is, uh, I don't know how many coats. It's just multiple, multiple coats of black and clear but this, it's gonna get probably 10 to 12 more, more coats. But this is what you kinda of wanna see as you're transitioning into getting very close to a finished guitar. It may not look like it, but uh, other than, than this one little hiccup where I let the sandpaper hit that corner, I knocked off a little bit of the black. I've gotta to touch up that, but otherwise, uh, uh, 10 to 15 coats of clear coat nitro in this area right here and obviously blending into the top and this area will be finished. It's that close. Other than, you know, the, the final buff work and all that jazz. So this is kind of what you can expect to see as you're, it's, it's funny, they get, they get kind of gaudy and big once they start coming together. But uh, really beautiful. I'm very happy with it. And uh, it's cool. I'm getting to the point where uh, all of my guitars are kind of, uh, you know, they're taking on this uh, unique um, personalized touch. In other words, I could look at a guitar and, and pretty much tell you, yeah, that's one of my guitars. Why? Because I'm a player. I'm not a collector. And I had mentioned this in the past where I, had, I built a Harley Davidson once, a chopper, really cool bike, early 90s Evo engine. It was a hardtail. Uh, American suspension front end and all this really cool stuff, but it was a writer's guitar because why? Because I'm in Alabama, man. There's, and ten, I was living in Tennessee at the time when I was starting to build the guitar, and uh, you know, you, you it's gonna get it, it's it's gonna get scratched up. So, so there's writers and there are players, <laughs> or writers and collectors, or players and collectors, and uh, anyway, I'll stop talking about that. You guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, the next thing will be uh, to come in at this point and uh, go ahead with just your brush, like a real nice little ch a clear China, China bristle brush or some sort of uh, badger hair brush and start building up some uh, uh, clear coats. Because, see, I had about five to seven coats on there, but by the time I started doing my blending and shaping, I took, took the bulk of that off but uh, left it in key locations where I didn't run the risk of, you know, getting into the black. Because if you did that, now all of your efforts to paint this black in component form and this clear in component form, now you lost every bit of that. But I did not see in this respect right here, I did not um, encroach on any of the black while I was sanding the clear or any of the clear while I was sanding the black. And then I can feel it right now. It's close enough for rockabilly and with about five to 10 coats, 15 coats of nitro, and it should blend in really beautifully. Okay. And if you're curious what it will look like, just look at the past video where I finished uh, flying V number, um, I think, yeah, this is number seven. It was flying V number six. That one turned out really well. Okay, so I'm gonna do, so I did a flyby. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and talk about this a little bit. Uh, looking at my list, it says glue in versus a bolt on, uh, seven sides. Uh, seven sides versus, you know, the glue in was seven sides that we had to glue in place and get everything to fit properly. And then in addition to the seven sides that were fit, we have five species of things going on here. We have the uh, rosewood, which is not going to be getting clear coated, but it will be getting oiled and it had to be sanded and blended in, but not at the expense of losing the profile. We had to maintain the taper. OK, 
Okay. So if, if you want to really ask yourself, what are you sanding everything to? You're fitting everything to the fretboard because your fretboard was pre-finished. And that's really critical. I'm glad that I went off the cuff there, but this was already a, a select a dimension here. I think it's two and three sixteenths of an inch at the 18th and one and 11 sixteenths at the nut. So that fretboard was finished. And had you started changing the fretboard in order to match anything else, well, then you would have lost the guitar. So you're dealing with uh, gluing in seven different uh, sides and getting everything to fit as we just covered. But then you're dealing now with a transitioning into clear coating five different species. Uh, the black nitro, the uh, clear Honduran mahogany, uh, the binding, and then number four would be uh, like the, the, the rosewood fretboard or ebony. And then number five would be your uh, uh, sparkle top or your top might, might be painted uh, a custom color. So you're, you're, you're now uh, connecting everything with the nitro cellulose lacquer and you're assuring that, you know, you finish the guitar. Okay. And that's what I'm about to do. And uh, I don't know if I mentioned it at the front of this video because I think this is the third time I've done this video. I keep getting too long winded. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that's just, I'm about to do a lot of that stuff. And I did not want to do it off camera and then just pop up here and go, oh, you know, here's the guitar. You know, it looks great because I'm not doing these video series to, uh, because I have a, 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 that I'm trying to get attention. I'm building these guitars because I feel like I'm getting to the point to where I've got a, a lot of knowledge that I can share with you guys that are, you know, might, might be doing a project for your first time. And you're trying to figure out, hmm, you know, can I take that neck off of that guitar and put it on here? And if I do, what can I expect to run into? Those are the type of things I like to talk about. So I'm going to pause the camera. Um, but I think before I do pause, I'm going to do a tone comparative of this guitar, this Husk, compared to the Explorer, uh, the 58 Explorer replica. And I'm not throwing the Explorer replica under the bus. It sounds amazing, but I just want you guys to realize that I didn't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on wood uh, to get a phenomenal sounding guitar Husk. So let's do just that. Uh, and if you're wearing earbuds, I would take them out. Or if you have your volume up, I would recommend you turn it down because this could get fairly uh, uh, brutal if you're if you've got it too high. I'm going to be taking this uh, uh, hammer, this uh, screwdriver, and, and and be tapping around the body and into the neck, and then I'll talk about it in case I forget. If you want to. If you want to gauge how sensitive your your woodwork is and and the quality level of the work that you've done, if you put this guitar body up to your ear and you simply uh, like just reach up here and just just touch it, I don't mean I don't mean rub or trying to make noise or tap on it. If you just reach up here and touch this, and and you can hear it down here, that's a master level guitar. And, and that's this guitar. And I, I'm not saying that because I'm a master guitar builder. I'm just saying you achieved a phenomenal glue join and your joinery is exceptional. Therefore, when your ABR1 bridge goes in there and your brass saddles or your nylon saddles and your bone nut and the Cluson tuners and you've got great frets, that's where the guitar, that's where your guitar comes from. That's where your tone comes from. So let's do just that. And I apologize for getting a little bit long winded there, but that was pretty important that, that you gauge how to read the sensitivity. So let's do uh, some tap tone. Three, two, one, ready?
try to meet those strings. But you get the gist. This is, uh, I think the, the wood alone for this guitar was, was pushing right at about $500. And the wood for that guitar that I built over there was wood that I've just had in my uh, storage forever. And I have to make certain that Explorer is extremely well protected because uh, it's, uh, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to pause the camera. I'm going to take the Explorer upstairs so that there's no risk of damage to it. So I'll be right back. So anyway, you can see how the, the little flying V sounds pretty big and, and very articulate for, uh, uh, I, I'm not going to say a small guitar body because these bodies are not small, it's just they're very long. So I'm going to pause the camera again and what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to do some clear coat right here and get that sealed and just show you what a couple of minutes of brush work will do. And then uh, I'm going to be going over to the drill press and and relieving that area right there and get it getting it ready to uh, do some route work. So let me pause the camera and I'll come back and we'll talk about this stuff. Okay, uh, let's dive back in. Uh, at this point, you know, all you're doing is just uh, relieving some of the the crap. Uh, but one thing I do like to do and that I recommend, uh, if there are any, any little uh, sharp corners that the router bit might catch on, uh, go ahead and kind of knock those off. Knock them out of the way. Don't try to finish the guitar. I'm just saying like there's a little sharp point right there. Uh, maybe come in from the top and take your little mallet and kind of knock off that little corner. Now, if you've got a real good router set up, and all that jazz and you work your way to the finish line you should be fine but I, as soon as I say that I'm the world's worst at, at, at slipping up and the router bit catching and jerking and uh, creating a little, little problem so anyway at this point what you're gonna want to do is really determine do your do your finish engineering and determine exactly uh, what you're going to be putting there, meaning the pickup, whether you're doing a, uh, you know, humbucker with the ring or you're doing like the, the P90 and you should have already engineered this stuff, obviously, uh, early, very early in the game. But the reason I mentioned the P90 is because a guy had commented in, I believe the second to the last video and he had asked me about converting from a humbucker to a P90 and I've never done that. And I, I don't know if they make some sort of ring that will do a conversion. Uh, that's not really my expertise. But usually when I do stuff like that, if I'm going from a humbucker or a large cavity to a P90, I would be uh, epoxy filling that in. Or in other words, I would, I would be epoxy gluing a large block into that body, sanding it, blending it, priming it, painting it, and rerouting per P90 specs with a P90 template. So that's the way I would do it. I don't, I don't like doing, uh, uh, you know, like retrofitting other, other type items into uh, a cavity that it wasn't designed for. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying I don't, I don't do stuff like that. And I don't really know how as well. And it would probably end up uh, uh, being a really interesting project so keep us posted on that one uh, but nonetheless I'm getting ready to uh, either do one or two things as I had mentioned in the last video and I'll go ahead and show it how how I would proceed with the pencil erasers and obviously keep, please understand I don't mean just the erasers and then you just throw this up there and then crank up the router these are not going to hold anything but they will at least give you a very nice a flat trustworthy surface and I've got oh here we go maybe put a big one back there and then just one or two right there and then you're going to come back in and possibly realign per a, a dot inlay or a center line that you've got or possibly with in my situation I would be able to go through these two ABR1 bridge locations and I could just about, I'm not going to do it. I'll try it. I'll, I'll, it'll be luck if I hit it. Yeah. it. It's somewhere in there. there. In other words, 
there are two ABR one uh, uh, holes drilled in the body right there, and you could align by that right there by pushing bamboo skewers through it, and that would guarantee you that the tail stays true, and then you could come up here and fasten this uh, in some fashion. Uh, a lot of times when I'm doing this type of route work, which is exactly how I'm about to do this, uh, I do this on my drill press. And I put the drill, because uh, I can change the gear ratio on my uh, uh, drill press, and I run it at 3,400 RPMs with a one inch, that's a one inch uh, face cut, and what is that? 20, well, I think that's 25 millimeter is one inch. It's about 25 millimeter, and with the erasers it, it works out perfectly I should be able to hold that up in the camera it works out perfectly so that the I'm just gonna let that sit on the the bot the finished bottom as of right now and look where the bearing is it's perfect okay with the little erasers it lifts it up and as long as so you could come back here with a a straight edge across here and put this on a table and put a clamp over here and a clamp over here and that would clamp that down and then you could run your handheld router. But in my situation, I'll probably just run those bamboo skewers through the back. I know I will. That's how I always do it. That'll guarantee that that fits that. Then I'll come up here with some tape and some jet glue up under here and I'll fasten everything. Then I'll just go to the drill press and I'll run it at, at 3,500 RPMs and do real gentle uh, passes until I get up to that point right there and then knock it out. So I'm gonna pause the camera and go do that. And the next time you see it, it'll have a pickup cavity ready to receive a Seymour Duncan type guitar uh, pickup. Hey guys, I'm going to fire up the camera briefly just to show you kind of uh, what I was talking about. Uh, this is very, these little erasers will probably start sliding because they're not fastened in place. And speaking of that, make certain that if you're doing any sort of machine work, that there's nothing that can move or vibrate or slide into your work or you'll get a violent surprise. So I'm doing this on a drill press and it's fairly low RPMs, 3,400 RPMs, give or take. But uh, just proceed with caution according to what you're doing. I really just wanted to use those to get everything lined up so that I could put some tape down at the end of the fretboard and then put some tape along the uh, template and then jet glue it down and, and I'll show you in, in a moment how you can take a little block and put tape on it and put a little drop of glue and then glue another one to it temporarily and then you use that as your your guide so all I'm doing is coming in with very shallow passes and just kind of uh, redefining the opening down there uh, and as I mentioned I came in and I drilled all that out rough but just, you know, really take your time. Don't try to write every bit of that in one step. I showed a really large bit, and I shouldn't have shown that bit uh, because the bit that I have chucked up in the drill press is only about 5 sixteenths of an inch tall. It's very, very short, and, I'm, and that right there uh, represents three different passes. The first pass was about an eighth of an inch high and then or deep, and then the second pass was, you know, close to a quarter. And then the third pass uh, was defined by the actual bearing. The bearing was beginning to get a little bit low on the thickness of the template. Excuse me. So if I had gone any further, I would have run the risk of getting below my jig and then getting into the bearing uh, collet and probably tearing up my jig before I realized uh, what I had done. Or worse, I went below the jig, and then now the router bit went beyond the uh, actual template. Okay, so when you're doing stuff like this, man, keep the radio off. Uh, I wouldn't recommend, you know, even letting the dog in the house. <laughs> Just really stay focused on what you're doing because we've spent a lot. We've spent a lot of hours to get to this point, and this is where. If there's ever a sickening point for it to be game over, it's right now. So I'm going to try to keep myself on point as well and just slowly finish the job. Uh, but I'll, I'm going to pause the camera, of course, and go finish the job. And then I'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about that. But I just wanted you to see kind of how, and I wasn't able to use the 
these bamboo skewers because the whole idea was this whole template was sliding forward about uh, not an eighth of an inch but almost an eighth so i really couldn't push those straight in but i was able to use them as an alignment but the most critical part was that when i was getting ready to temporarily glue this jig down that i was assessing the original route location side to side because i wasn't changing the side to side but i was just elongating that uh, pocket okay so there you have it. Let me pause, finish the job, then I'll vacuum it out and we'll, we'll go from there. I forgot to show you guys what I was talking about when you are getting ready to uh, temporarily glue two little boards together. Let's say we're go you're going to use this as some sort of temporary template or something. Then you simply put the tape on one side and then just do a simple little drop there for that for that area and then uh, let's say you let's say you wanted this thing to I don't know maybe come across those two points right there then uh, you basically just I'm gonna do it and then I'll show you what I did got it on my marks and just hold it temp about five or six seconds and it should be fine and then you could do your your route work where the little bearing you know runs across there and comes in and routes that and then when you're through you simply twist it and and pull it loose and then um, it's a real clean way of doing uh, route work i could have done that there but I wanted to take advantage of the fact that I paid so much money for those templates. So if I'm gonna if I'm gonna spend all my money on my templates, I'm gonna work them. <laughs> so anyway, I'll pause, finish the job, and I'll be right back. Hey guys, I'll do a bit of a flyby with uh, respect to the progress. A few more minutes devoted here. You can see where the uh, I'm just gonna let those erasers slide out. Uh, for the most part, they're not really all that important the way I'm using the drill press. If I was doing this with a handheld router, I would have this uh, fastened to a table with a bar across it, everything locked in position so that all I have to do is watch the bearing along the template and not worry about the job. But sometimes you're moving, uh, the you're, you're keeping the machinery fixed and you're moving the uh, item that you're cutting like if you're using a table saw you know you're moving the board you're cutting but if you're using a uh, like a router typically you like to fasten you need to fasten your material and then move the tool but in this respect if I'm using a drill press I'm running at a fairly slow RPM 3400 so I got to be real real patient as I work my way to the finish line and always always make climbing cuts I'm sorry not climbing cuts cutting cuts where the router bit is turning uh, clockwise oh, meaning like since this is cutting overhead it's going to be turning clockwise make certain that you're cutting in this direction right here don't ever start doing climbing cuts because it'll definitely start running with you or you'll get real bad chatter turning out really well so I'll pause the camera again and then finish the job and we'll go from there okay that's going to be a world record for a pause uh, it's been paused for probably 45 minutes if not longer uh, i got all that machined out we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment but i had a really interesting discovery when i was epoxy gluing in my neck I failed to to tape over that <laughs> that drill location because see before I glued the neck in I ran a 3 16 7 inch drill bit all the way through so that I once I installed this pickup the uh, wire could go through there and then go down in that corner and come out into the control cavity well all of that epoxy uh, gravity took its course and, and a lot of the spillover epoxy ran all the way down in there and, and I could not get the wire through. So I had to basically sit there with broken drill bits 
and just kind of work it out a little bit and kind of like hand drill it up to the point where I couldn't reach it anymore. So I had to break out my torch and uh, heat up the uh, drill bits, those short little drill bits that were broken bits. And uh, I'm not sure where they are, it doesn't matter, but neither here nor there, it took about 30 minutes to heat up the bits and kind of ram them through, but being really cautious not to, you know, burn anything up so anyway uh sometimes you have to uh sometimes you have to back up and punt so uh fortunately now uh, whomever buys this guitar when they install their their pickup you know as you can see that wire there's absolutely no restriction whatsoever okay so Plan your work and work your plan, but always be prepared for reality. Um, this is this is routed out just a little bit oversized, probably about a sixteenth of an inch, but that's okay. I'd rather it be a little bit big than a little bit tight. So uh, it turned out really well, and it's really beautiful because it shows the absolute just flawless quarter stone uh, mahogany tenon in the old antique pine, which is really beautiful. And I did a little bit more uh, router work in these corners. Again, to recap, I started out with that bit really short, took off the top, transitioned over to that bit, moved it down a little bit, finished out with that one right there. Okay. Let me uh, let me get a drink of water because I didn't realize uh, that epoxy uh, smelled smelled up the uh, shop fairly bad. Okay, so after you finish your route work, uh, what's going to happen is you're going to have the tenon. The tenon is still going to be uh, sticking up right across here because the router only cut off this edge right here. But So you'll have to come in and you'll have to use your pull saw and ever so cautiously pull a little bit on this side. Pull a little bit on that side and then maybe use the, the first two teeth and pull across the top. Can't slip. It's not an option. So it took me about 10 minutes to notch that out. I could have just gone up there with a chisel and a hammer and cowboyed my way to the finish and just banged it out. But you run the risk of, of bust out and you don't want to do things like that. Not when you've come this far. You want that to be a beautiful, uh, very much hand finished, uh, hand hand level uh, transition that is uh, flat with the top, the sparkle, but is also flat with the end of the neck. Because you're going to be coming in here under this edge right here. See how that see how that buried up in there. You're going to have to come in here in this end with some rosewood and slide in some real thin wedges on either side because of the pitch of the neck. Okay, so there's a lot more going on here than just you know bolting a, a maple neck onto an older body. I think you, you, you can read between the lines there. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with those guitars at all, but that's what I just meant by at the beginning of this series. Uh, uh, I mean, the beginning of this video, you got seven sides connected, five species, and this is the this is along the lines of you know building a jazz guitar, where you're doing all this extreme joinery and all this binding and all that jazz. Again, I'm not I'm not trying to you know brag or anything. I'm just saying this is a this is a fun guitar to do in video series because it shows you uh, a uh, how much can be done. Or B, you know, what shouldn't be done? You know, if you're just a player and you just want to build a guitar that has a neck and a body, then this is this is way too, this is way way overkill. But nonetheless, you know, if you want to do really a beautiful, enjoyable work, or you're learning, that's where I really should be going with this. If you're learning and you're preparing to start doing a uh, true guitar building, uh, then hey man, practice on something like this. Uh, don't be practicing on a thousand dollars worth of European uh, uh, spruce and maple, and and learning uh, lessons the the hard way. You want to practice on stuff like this that is, uh, you know, if you did lose it, 
Yeah, man, it would be sickening. It really would. It would be sickening if you screwed up and had to uh, either can it or make some major transitions. But but nonetheless, uh, I'd much rather lose something like this than, you know, like I just said. Okay, so very quickly turning into a, a little rock and roll guitar. And uh, she's going to have a beautiful tone. I mean, it's just the way you do it. I'm holding it like there, like that, just kind of letting it float and just letting it breathe. There, there are things that are called node, nodal points. Like if this was a large board, if you reached up here and held it basically in that area, if it was about four inches wide, five inches wide, about 30 inches long, you could tap on this and it'll start ringing along the lines of like a, probably like a xylophone. You know how they have the little floating keys and you hit that xylophone, that key in it, and it rings. Well, that's called a node, N-O-D-E. And I'm doing the best I can to kind of find like the nodal point and then just, you know, do the tapping. And I'm kind of moving my thumb around a little bit. Beautiful guitar. Just very articulate, very clear, and uh, no, no buzziness, no muffled. Uh, you know, just, just a great little project. All right, so the next thing would be, uh, let's do some sealing. Let's, uh, at this point, you want to have your, uh, I always keep like, as I'm doing spray lacquer, if my lacquer ends up getting a little bit aged and maybe get a little bit contaminated. Well, I pour it over into a little container like that. And I just have like this little brush that I got at, the, at a big box hardware store. And I simply, let me just blow it out. I've already uh, hit it with a vacuum, but you just simply come in here and just seal it. Uh, because I like the idea of sealing the woods um, in the event something comes up and you get distracted and you get sidetracked and you have to stop the project, I can't tell you how many times I've been right in the middle of thinking, man, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be putting the frets in this afternoon. And then I get a phone call, you know, and life happens or something, you know, takes place or either I get a phone call to build a custom guitar, man, this, this thing goes on the shelf. And it gets it gets shelved for six months, a year or longer. This particular guitar has been shelved uh, or shelved, I should say, I think for three to four months because I landed uh, two other builds throughout the process. And it wasn't that big of a deal, but it is kind of frustrating because you know you're when you're you're in the mode to do a particular job and then you have to stop and change gears, like right now. I would almost hate for the phone to ring and someone want me to build a, an acoustic 16-inch, uh, you know, uh, archtop jazz guitar because that's a whole different world and I would almost need three weeks just to get in the mindset of it, if that makes any sense. Because we're, we're building a little rock and roll supermodel, you know, with a guitar like this. And nonetheless, if you do have to stop, at least you got the wood sealed and you don't run any risk of, uh, you know, just moisture getting in the in the body or in the neck, I should say. Well, both. I'm trying to keep this in the camera, but but also just do the job. So keep a little little trash brush like that, and uh, doesn't have to be beautiful. That's already sealed. That's been uh, uh, brushed probably probably seven or eight different times. And there's no sense in doing anything here because once I start doing all of my final clear coat, I will now leave that uh, spray cover off and I'll start spraying. Let me make sure that doesn't run. Then when I'm doing my clear coat, I'll let the nitro just uh, spray down in there and seal all that. So let me flip this over. And I, well, I did. I did exactly what I should not have done. Let me, um, I may pause here. And uh, well, let me just do it in real time. I'll let that lacquer get up on the uh, fretboard. It's no big deal. 
but you wouldn't have wanted it to dry. And anytime you do do that's lacquer thinner, uh, don't use too much. But if you do do a little bit of wiping right there, go ahead and do an area. But I've mentioned this in past videos. Uh, I wouldn't recommend uh, taking a clean uh, cloth with lacquer on it and then start trying to wipe this because these rosewoods they they have a lot of oils in them, and the oil from the lac the lacquer thinner will cause the oil to. Uh, uh, what's the word, a leech, and it might contaminate the mahogany. So anytime you're doing cleaning right here, make sure you're doing cleaning between different species with just like a washcloth. And I think this one's still just a little bit moist, but it's not wet. Yeah, it's moist enough to show a really good example of what I was just talking about. So I can do my cleaning, get the dust off, but not run the risk of transferring the oily dark woods into uh, uh, the beautiful other woods. Okay. All right. Let me check the time. I probably will pause the camera, get it cleaned up and reorganized and just determine how I'm going to finish the video. Okay. I'll briefly discuss how I uh, address that uh, epoxy in that location right there, because uh, in the event, let's say you built this guitar and you completely blanked and you forgot to drill a hole for the uh, the wiring uh, location, you could come through. Uh, you you could you could come in at this location right here where there's going to be a. Uh, let me do this. Let me pause and get the drill bit. Okay, what I had to do, obviously, I had to take a broken drill bit and that, that I could get down, down in the location and then just kind of start working my way like that and doing like a, a hand a drill, you know, a sixteenth of an inch turn each time until I could work it away without tearing up the bottom of the guitar. There's no sense in panicking and coming in here and, you know, trying to drill drill it out you'll just you'll just tear all the stuff up here so if you do freak out and you get in a bad mood maybe just flip off the lights and address it tomorrow or the next day because all it is is epoxy or glue or something that's in a cavity that needs to be melted out uh, because what you can't get out with this right here you know by drilling it you once you get to that point right there then you can determine can you get to it from the other side and you know maybe if you have to change your direction then so be it but but mine yeah it did. i didn't think it was going to fit but my my drill cavity ends right here but uh, i was not able to get the drill bit in from this location so i had to work everything from this side over here and then once i got it to the point to where i knew that uh, i was able to to push a smaller wire through it uh, i got my uh, propane torch out and I had that baby heated up like you wouldn't believe. And I was basically, uh, I was melting the, the, new, the new location. And if anything, that certainly will never have to worry about, we won't have to worry about moisture because all that epoxy is melted into the, to, to the wood. And then came over from the other side and did the same thing. But because of the uh, restriction in, in getting a certain length in here, we, we know that we can't just make a one pass, so you got to go from both sides. And then once I got it to the point to where I knew I was pretty close, uh, I heated this baby up, dropped it in there with a pair of uh, needle nose pliers, and then I used another broken drill bit as a pusher, and I pushed it through. And then where it came out on the other side, then I pushed it back, and I pushed it back, and I just worked it till I could... Uh, you know, get it under control, and but also make certain that nothing got melted in in place. Because if it hit of a dried, if it hit of dried, uh, and then I panicked, then uh, you know, it might have been more difficult to have gotten it out. Okay, but let's say, let's say you did screw up real bad and you couldn't get it out or whatever, or either you just forgot to do it. You could come in with a long drill bit. An eighth of an inch drill bit is not large enough. You would think it is, but it simply isn't. It, you probably would be able to get a clean cut wire through there, but once any little bit of 
uh, nitrocellulose lacquer sealer gets in there, and if you get a little bit of a, of a ball or rollover, a little bit of dust or contamination, eighth of an inch is not going to be big enough. So you could I always drill these with a uh, 3 16th of an inch bit. And then uh, my nose is itching from that epoxy. But if you did have to do this as an afterthought, you just drill through that location right there. And you take it wherever you want. And with a, with a real nice long drill bit, well, sky's the limit, man. I, I can take it all the way to that control cavity if I had to. Don't want to do that. I prefer to do things like take it into this control cavity and then pick up from there and then and then finish out in that location right there okay should make perfect sense so build your guitar and just think think about paths it's all geometry that's all it is we're just dealing with uh straight lines and angles and roundovers and runaway epoxy that you should not should not have allowed to happen. Again, you know, if I'd have just had the tape over there, it wouldn't have been an issue. But as I've said before, the whole idea about deception or a mistake is just that. Well, you don't, you don't get set out to make mistakes. You, it's, you know, it just happens and then you have to address it. That really is a lot of building a guitar or for that matter, anything kind of unique that has so many different operations, you, you can't help but screw up. It's just like that right there. Everything was going great until the little jig that I had where I was routing out the, the base of that tendon broke loose. And, and I was doing my routing, and I felt the router go over a little bit further than I thought it should have. And I thought, and I should have stopped. But I thought, well, that's strange. Maybe I hadn't routed over far enough, and I went ahead and continued to route. So you know, I had to you know, do a little repair. Does it matter? Oh, of course not. It's irrelevant. Well, does it matter? Yeah, yeah, it does. I shouldn't say that. That sounds, sounds uh, like I'm uh, being lazy and doing shoddy work, which I don't. I love doing high-quality work. But I guess where I'm trying to go with this uh, – like a lot of us, I, I used to. I don't anymore. I used to suffer from uh, being a, an extreme perfectionist. And everything about everything I was trying to do, building a guitar, I was trying to satisfy some sort of, you know, pursuit, re relentless pursuit of perfection or whatever that term is. But I got to be honest with you. If that's, if that's your personality, last thing you want to be doing is building guitars because it, you'll, you'll lose your mind. It'll drive you crazy because there's so many little hiccups and little mistakes that you're going to have to be addressing or correcting that uh, by the time the guitar is finished and said and done, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be so wound up, you will have not enjoyed the build at all. And it will have been a miserable three-month process if you were lucky to have finished it that quickly. So, so why does it not matter? Because it's covered up. And, and at this point right here, the, the way I would tune this, the location, that's a very thin piece of uh, 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 aluminum, I mean, uh, stainless steel. It's just a little straight edge ruler. That I usually hold the uh, pickup ring off the end by about that thickness. What is that dimension? I have no idea. It looks like it's about a third of a millimeter or probably about, uh, it's less than a 32nd of an inch. I can't really show it because I'm trying to hold the guitar and then once I pull it out, it's just going to fall in. But it'll have an ever so small amount of a gap. And if anything, I think that's cool. I don't know if you'll be able to see that, but someone could look down in there and go, oh, wow, I still see the gold sparkle. You know, so, wow, that's pretty cool. And, the, and it would keep them from pulling this thing apart and, and being curious because most people don't want to know what's in the transmission, as I've discussed before. But I don't recommend butting it directly up against that because you might get some buzzing because of the vibration. Okay. So uh, coming together very quickly. And uh, I don't really, I was going to talk a little bit. Let me check the time. I was going to talk a little bit about uh, the P90 options because uh, I may have mentioned earlier in this video, a guy had commented about, hey, you know, what do you recommend about transitioning from a P90 I mean, from a humbucker to a P90, you know, and, and, and I may have already mentioned, I don't really know. I don't really know what to tell you there. Uh, all I know is that, uh, 
I will share this with you guys. Uh, it, it, that's that's a humbucker route. If you can see it, this thing's clear. It's kind of hard to see through it, but that's your humbucker route, your traditional. And then this is going to be your. Uh, This is going to be your P90s. That's going to that's what a P90 route is going to look like. Now I say that that that's a quarter inch radius corner, but you'll be using a half inch, a half inch radius. I guess I will have to talk about this. <laughs> uh, the outside edge of that P90 cover that's a half inch radius, but these templates um, they are a quarter of an inch. But when you route it out, you use a half inch bit. Okay, just like I showed you the three bits earlier. That way, once you do the routing for the P90, the, the routing corners that you turn are the correct radius to match the P90 that goes down and recesses in. And I may have already mentioned, I don't like the idea of getting some sort of pickup surround that supports a P90 because if you're not a true player, the whole idea about playing a guitar with a P90 on it is the phenomenal uh, uh, clearness of not having the restriction around the lower edge of that pickup. It, it's so incredible, especially if you're a jazz guy. We we plant our pinky right here as we're doing pick work up into the uh, upper register. And then I say jazz, you know, bluegrass. You know, I do a lot of hillbilly type <laughs> rockabilly stuff. So I'll plant my pinky right there. But I always hate it when I'm playing a Les Paul or something with that ring because I crash into that right there. So if you're going to do a P90, I say go go full P90 benefit. And I would fill in that area and then route out for the authentic P90. And uh, even if you have to do some paint touch up or something like that. Um, and I'm just going to stop because I don't want anybody to think I'm being a jerk. But uh, they're, they're quite different, um, the location or the routing of it all. But if you want to, uh, I built a, uh, I think the, the video series was how to, how to design build a custom, uh, a, a 1955 Les Paul custom, meaning an actual uh, custom, the, the Les Paul with the, uh, the square inlays, uh, all the binding. I think it was like a seven piece binding on the front, five piece on the back. Uh, I go into extensive detail around video 25, about uh, 24, 25, 26, about uh, installing P90s. And I talk about the hazards, the benefits, the beauty, the frustration, and all the stuff that, I, that I've already forgotten. So check those video series out, or that video series out about the custom Les Paul. That was probably, it might be close to a year ago. So uh, check that out, and uh, hopefully that'll help you out. Otherwise, I'm going to end the video right there. I appreciate you guys checking in. Let me see if I can turn it so it's pretty. Let's do a bit of a flyby. I don't knock anything. No, not my coffee over. Close, very close. A lot going on there. Two piece binding. Let's do, let's run through the specs very quickly. Um, and uh, antique pine quarter sewn from the 1800s, 17 degree pitch headstock under mahogany, um, rosewood, a 12 inch radius, mother of pearl dot inlays from Stuart McDonald, double adjustable truss rod. That's kind of cool because even though this, well, this one's not, but if this were a historical guitar, that would protect the industry and keep someone from getting taken advantage of in the event someone reliced uh, a Carina Limba Flying V and claimed that it was a 50s guitar. Uh, and it's this one's obviously not because it's got this crazy ass sparkle all over it. But, uh, but anyway, uh, it is what it is. It's a fun guitar. And uh, is it ever a great opportunity to possibly do a Floyd Rose? Oh, man, yeah. But um, I personally think this antique pine is so rare and so resonant. Uh, I would really recommend not going with the Floyd Rose on this one. I would go with the traditional ABR one bridge, and I would do a hard, hard tail tail. And that thing will sound phenomenal. Okay, so I'll end the video there because otherwise I'll just go off on a tangent of, of just 
uh, endless chatter about different options and stuff like that. So I appreciate you guys checking in. I hope it wasn't a waste of time. I know it was a very long video, but hopefully there was some good stuff in there about, uh, you know, transitioning into uh, a finished guitar. All right. I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks.